All right, chapter 13, 14, 14, 14. Yeah, goodness. Chapter 14, how all were very busy. A little before two o'clock, Trumpkin and the Badger sat with the rest of the creatures at the wood's edge, looking across the gleaming line of Miraz's army, which was about two arrow shots away. In between, a square space of level ground had been stacked for the combat. At the two far corners stood Glozelle and Sospian with drawn swords. Near the corners were the giant Wimbleweather and the bubbly bear, who, in spite of all their warnings, was sucking his paws into telling the truth, looking quite silly. To make up for this, Glenstorm on the right of the list stalked still, except when he stamped his hind foot occasionally on the turf, looked much more imposing than the tumbling baron who faced him on the left. Peter had just shaken hands with Edmund and the doctor and was now walking down to the combat. It was like the moment before a pistol goes off at an important race, but so much worse. I wish Aslan had turned up before it came to this. So do I, said Truffle Hunter. Both behind you. Crows and crockery, muttered the dwarf as soon as he had done so. But what are they? Huge people, beautiful people, like gods and goddesses and giants, hundreds and thousands of them, closing in behind us. What are they? It's the dryads, him dryads, Sylvan, said Truffle Hunter. Aslan has waked them. Humph, said the dwarf. That'll be very useful if the enemy try any treachery, but it won't help the high king very much if Miraz proves handier with his sword. The badger said nothing, for now Peter and Miraz were entering the lists from opposite ends, both on foot, both in chain shirts, with helmets and shields. They advanced till they were close together, both bowed and seemed to speak, but it was impossible to hear what they said. The next moment, two swords flashed in the sunlight. For a second clash, it could be heard, but it was immediately drowned out because both armies began shouting like crowds at a football game. Well done, Peter. Oh, well done, shouted Esmond. Edmund, as he as he saw Mira's reel back a whole pace and a half, followed up quick, and Peter did, and for a few seconds, it looked as if the fight might be won. But then Mira's pulled himself together and began to make real use of his height, white, height and weight. Mira's Miraz, Miraz, the king, the king, came the roar of the Talmarines. Caspian and Peter grew white with sickening anxiety. Peter's taking some dreadful knocks, said Edmund. What? What's happening now? Both falling apart. A bit blown, I expect. Ah, they're beginning again, more scientifically this time, circling round and round, feeling each other's defenses. I'm afraid Miraz knows his work, muttered the doctor. But hardly had he said this when there was such clapping and banging and throwing up of old hoods and the old Narnians that it was nearly deafening. What's, what's that? Asked the doctor. My old eyes missed it. The high king has pricked him in the armpit, said Caspian, clapping, just where the armhole of the Hubert let point through. First blood. It's looking ugly again, though. Peter's not using his shield properly. He must be hurt on his left arm. It was only too true. Everyone could see that Peter's shield hung limp, shouting the tumbrines redoubled. You've seen more battles than I, said Caspian. Is there any chance now? Very little, said Edmund. I suppose he might just do it with luck. Oh, why did we let this happen at all, said Caspian. Suddenly, all the shouting on both sides died down. Edmund was puzzled for a moment and then said, Oh, I see. They've both agreed to a rest. Come on, doctor. You and I may be able to do something for the high king. They ran down the list, and Peter came outside the ropes to meet them, his face red and sweaty, his chest heaving. Is your left arm wounded? said Peter. No, it's not exactly a wound. I got the full weight of his shoulder on my shield, like a load of bricks, and the rim of the shield drove into my wrist. I don't think it's broken, but it might be sprained. If you could tie it up very tight, I think I can manage. While they were doing this, Edmund asked him anxiously, what do you think of him though, Peter? Tough, very tough. I have a chance if I can keep him on the top till his weight is short and wind comes out of him. In this hot sun too, to tell the truth, I haven't got much chance else. Give my love to everyone at home, Ed. If he gets me, here he comes to the list again. So long, old chap. Goodbye, doctor. I say, Ed, there's something to say. Say something nice, especially to Trumpkin. He's been a brick. Edmund couldn't speak. He walked back to the doctor with his own eyes, with a sick feeling in his stomach. But the new bat went well. Peter now seemed to be able to make some use of his shield and certainly made good use of his feet. He was almost playing Tig with mirrors now, keeping out of range, shifting around, making his enemy work. Coward booed the town marines. Why don't you stand up to him? Don't you like it? Thought you came to fight, not dance. Oh, I hope he won't listen to them, said Caspian. He won't. You don't know him. Oh, Ramirez had gotten a blow at last on Peter's helmet. Peter staggered, slipped sideways, and fell on one knee. The roar of town marines rose like a were noise of the sea. Now, Miraz, now, quick, kill him, kill him. Indeed, there was no need to egg on the usurper. He was on top of Peter already. Edmund bit his lip till blood came as the sword flashed down on Peter. It looked as if it were to flash off his head. Thank heavens, it glanced down off the right shoulder. The door fraught mail was sound and it did not break. Great Scott, cried Edmund. He's up again. Go, Peter, go. I could see, I couldn't see what happened, said the doctor and Cornelius. How did he do it? 
Grab Nerys' arm as it came down. There's a name for it. He uses his enemy's arm as a ladder. The High King, the Kai King, up old Narnia. Look, Nerys is angry. It's good. They were certainly at it, hammer and tongs now. Such a flurry of blows, it seemed impossible for either not to be killed. As the excitement grew, it, the shouting almost died away. Spectators were holding their breath. It was most horrible and most magnificent. A great shout arose from old Narnians. Miraz was down, not struck by Peter, but face down, having tripped on a tussock. Peter stepped back, waiting for him to rise. Oh, bother, said Edmund to himself. Need he be as gentlemanly as that? I suppose he must. Um comes of being a knight and a high king. I suppose it's what Aslan would like. That brute would give up in a minute, and then, but that brute never rose. The Lords Glozell and Sospian had their own plans already. As soon as they saw their king down, they leaped into the list. Treachery, treachery, the Narnian traitor stabbed him in the back while he lay helpless. To arms, to arms. Peter hardly understood what was happening. He saw two big men running towards him with swords drawn. Then a third town marine leaped over the ropes. To arms, Narnia, treachery, Peter shouted. If all three had set upon him at once, he would have never have spoken again. But Glozell stopped to stab his own king dead where he lay. That's for your insult this morning, he whispered as the blade went home. Peter swung to face Sospi and slashed his legs from under him and with the back cut of the same stroke, walloped off his head. Edmund was now at his side, crying, Narnia, Narnia, the lion! The whole Telmarine army rushed toward them, but now the giant was stamping forward, stooping low, swinging his glove. Centaurs charged, twang, twang, behind, and hiss, hiss, overhead came the archery of the dwarfs. Trumpkin was fighting at his left. Full battle had happened. Come back, Reaper Cheap, shouted Peter. You'll only be killed. This is no place for mice. Both ridiculous little creatures were dancing in and among of the feet of both armies, jabbing with their swords. Melanie, a Telmarine warrior that day, felt his foot suddenly pierced as if a dozen skewers hopped on one leg. As if by a dozen skewers hopped on one leg and fell as often as not. If he fell, the mice finished him off. If he did not, someone else did. But almost before the Narnians really warmed their work, they found the enemy giving way. Tough-looking warriors turned white, gazed in terror, not on the old Narnians, but something behind them, and then flung down their weapons, shrieking, The wood, the wood, the end of the world! But as soon as neither of their cries nor the sound of the weapons could be heard anymore, for both were drowned out by the ocean war of the roar of the awakened trees, as they plunged through the ranks of Peter's army, and then on in pursuit of the Telmarines. Have you ever stood at the edge of a great wood on a high ridge when a southern... A south, wild southwestern wind broke over it in fuel, full fury on an autumn evening. Imagine that sound, and then imagine the wood, instead of being fixed one place, was rushing at you. And no longer trees, but huge people, yet still like trees because their long arm waved like branches, and their heads tossed, and leaves fell around them in showers. It was like that for the Telmarines. It was a little alarming, even for the Narnians. In a few minutes, all of Miraz's followers were running down to the Great River in hope of crossing the bridge to the town of Berna and defending themselves behind their ramparts to close the gates. They reached the river, but there was no bridge. It had disappeared before yesterday. But an utter panic and horror fell upon them, and they all surrendered. But what had happened to the bridge? Early that morning, after a few hours sleep, the girls had woken, and to see Aslan standing over them, to hear his voice saying, we will make a holiday. And they rubbed their eyes until they could look around them. The trees had all gone, but could still be seen moving toward Aslan's house in a dark mass. Bacchus and Matus were fierce, maddening, um, Bacchus and the maidens, his fierce and madcap girls, and Selenius were still with them. Lucy was fully rested, jumped up. Everyone was awake, everyone was laughing, flutes were playing, cymbals crashing, animals, not talking animals, were crowding on them from every direction. What is it? Aslan Lucy asked her dancing feet. Come on, children, ride on my back today. Oh, lovely, cried Lucy. And both girls climbed onto the warm golden back as they had done. No one knew how many years before, and the whole party moved off. As an eat leaving, Bacchus and the Maenads leaping, rushing, turning somersaults, beasts frisking around them, Selenius and his donkey bringing up the rear. They turned a little to their right, raced down a steep hill, and found a long bridge of Verna in front of them. Before they began to cross it, however, out of the water came a great wet bearded head, larger than a man's, crowned with rushes. Its voice, it looked at Aslan, out of its mouth came, Hail, Lord, loose my chains. River God, but shh, said Lucy. Bacchus, deliver him from his change. That means the bridge, I think, said Lucy. And so it did. Bacchus and his 
people splashed forward into the shallow water and a moment later the most curious things were happening great strong trunks of ivy came curling up all the piers of the bridge growing as quickly as fibers wrapping stones splitting breaking separating them sorry guys the walls of the bridge turned to hedges with Hawthorne for a moment and then disappeared as the whole thing with the crash and a rumble collapsed into the swirling water. With much splashing, screaming, and laughing, the revelers waded or swam or danced across the fjord. Hurrah, it's the fjord of Berna again, cried the girls, and up the bank on the far side into their own town. Everyone in the street fled for their faces. The first house they came to was a, was a school, a girls' school, where a lot of Narnian girls with their hair done very tight and ugly collars round their necks and thickly thick stockings on their legs were having a history lesson. The sort of history that was taught in Narnia under Mira's rule was duller than the true history you've ever read and less true than the most exciting adventure story. If you don't attend Gwendolyn, said the mistress, stop looking out the window. I will have to get an order, Mike. But please, Miss Prizzle, did you hear what I said, Gwendolyn? But please, Miss Prizzle, there's a lion. That's two order marks for talking nonsense, Miss Prizzle. And now, a roar interrupted her. I became curling in the window of the classroom. The walls, a great mass of shimmering green leafy branches, arched overhead the ceiling. Miss Prizzle found she was standing on grass in a forest glade. She clutched at her desk to steady herself and found the desk was a rose bush. Wild people she had never imagined were crowding around her. She saw the lion, screamed and fled with her class, who were mostly dumpy, prim little girls with fat legs. Gwendolyn hesitated. You'll stay with us, sweetheart, asked Aslan. Oh, may I? Thank you, thank you, said Gwendolyn, and instantly she joined hands with two of the Maynards, who whirled around her in a merry dance, who helped her take off some of the unnecessary and uncomfortable clothes she was wearing. Wherever they went, the little town of Verna, it was the same. Most people fled, a few joined them, and when they all left the town, they were a larger and happier company. They swept on across the level fields in the northern bank or left bank of the river. At every farm, animals came out to join them. Saddled donkeys who had never known joy suddenly grew young again. Chained dogs broke their chains and the horses kicked their carts to pieces and came trotting along with them, clop, clop, kicking up the mud and whinnying. At a well in the yard, they met a man who was beating a boy. The stick burst into a flower in the man's hand. He tried to drop it, but it stuck to his hand, and his arm became a branch, and his body the trunk of a tree, and his feet the tree took root. The boy, who had been crying a moment before, burst out laughing and joined them. A little down, town halfway to Beaver's Dam, where the two rivers met, there became another school, where a tired-looking girl was teaching arithmetic to a number of boys who looked very much like pigs. She looked out the window and saw the divine revelers singing up the street. A stab of joy went through her heart. Aslan stopped right under the window and looked up at her. Oh, don't, don't. I'd love to, but I mustn't. I must stick to my work, and the children would be frightened if they saw you. Frightened, said the most pig-like of the boys. Who's she talking to out the window? Let's tell the inspector she talks to people out the window and she ought to be teaching us. Let's go and see who it is, said another boy, and they all came crowding to the window. But as soon as their mean little faces looked out, Bacchus gave a great cry of Ewan, oi, 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 and the little boys all began howling at the fright and trampling one another down to get out the door and jumping out the windows. And it was said afterwards, whether truly or not, that those particular little boys were never seen again, but there were a lot of very fine pigs in that part of the country who had never been there before. Now, dear heart, said Aslan to the teacher, and she jumped down and joined them. At Beaver's Dam, they recrossed the river and came east again to the southern bank. They came to a little cottage where a child stood in the doorway crying. Why are you crying, my love? asked Aslan. The child, who had never seen a picture of a lion, who was not afraid, Auntie's very ill. She's going to die. And then Aslan went in to go into the cottage, but it was too small for him. So when he got his head through, he pushed with his shoulders. Lucy and Susan fell off when he did this and lifted the whole house up, and it fell backwards and apart. There, still laying in her bed, though, as was now in the open air, lay a little old woman who looked as if she had dwarf blood in her. She was at death's door when she opened her eyes and saw the bright, hairy head of the lion staring at her face. She didn't scream. Oh, Aslan, I knew it was true. I've been waiting for this all my life. Have you come to take me away? Yes, dearest, but not the long journey yet. And as he spoke, the flush creeping along the underside of a cloud at sunrise, the color came back to her face. And her eyes grew bright and she sat up. Why do you think I do feel a little better? I think I could take a little breakfast this morning. Here you are, said Bacchus, dipping a pitcher in the cottage well and handing it to her. But what was in it was not water, but a richest grind, wine, red as red currant jelly, smooth as oil, strong as beef, warming as tea, cool as dew. Eh, hey, you've done something to our well, said the old woman. That makes a nice change, that does. 
Right on me, said Aslan, and added to Susan and Lucy, you two queens will have to run now. We'd like that just as much, said Susan. And off they were. So at last, with leaping and dancing, singing and music and laughter, and roaring, barking, and neighing, they all came to the place where Mira's army stood, flinging down their swords, holding up their hands, and Peter's army, still holding their weapons and breathing hard, stood around them with stern and glad faces. And the first thing that happened was the old woman slipped off of Adson's back and ran across to Caspian and embraced one another, for she was his old nurse.